All right, good evening everyone. Welcome to uh, Thursday Night Devotions. Good to uh, be with you once again. I hope and pray that you've uh, had a good week or having a good week. I hope today was a good day for you and uh, that you've uh, enjoyed your day and uh, you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. <laughs> if you're watching this. <laughs> oh, anyway, praise the Lord. I thank uh, each and every one of you that do uh, watch and send comments. And even if you don't watch it live, you know what I mean? Praise the Lord. I mean, for many folks will watch it the next day. So God bless you all. All right, let's, uh, let's get into it tonight. We're going to be in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, you know, the word cancer, or hearing cancer, to hear the word cancer. You know, if you were sitting in the doctor's room and, and the doctor said, it's cancer. I couldn't think of a word. Brother Michael Ross, good evening. I couldn't think of a, I think it could, I couldn't think of a word that would polarise. Pond family, good evening. A lot of people. The word cancer, to hear the word cancer is really hard to take. For saved and unsaved alike. Uh, when you think about cancer, it's devastating. It's destructive. And in most cases and in most cancers, it's a death sentence. I've had three family members of mine go home to be with the Lord through cancer. First one was in 1989. My grandfather went to be with the Lord. He was our doorman in our church, loved his job. Uh, had only been saved for six years, got saved at the age of 60. We were praying for him for a lot of years and he got saved. And man, when he got saved, he got saved. And, and he, was, he would sing in the choir and he would um, yeah, just serve the Lord, just serve the Lord. And when he got saved, he gave up smoking. And he rolled his own, you know the old rollies, he rolled his own for many, many, many years. He got throat cancer. Uh, then uh, Brother Clive, good evening. My mother-in-law went home to be with the Lord through cancer. Uh, Jen, good evening. And my brother-in-law went home to be with the Lord through cancer. And he was my first funeral that I did uh, as, a, as a pastor. My brother-in-law had brain tumour. My mother, she went home through smoking-related diseases. She had emphysema, but there was the possibility of cancer there. So cancer, when you think of the word cancer, you don't think of anything too happy, do you? I mean, again, it's, it's a word that is polarizing. Sue Ellen, good evening. Nobody wants to hear the doctor say, I'm sorry, it's cancer because of the devastating nature of it. But what about cancerous words? Cancerous words. When you think of what the Bible says about the words that people speak in Proverbs 18 and verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's an interesting verse, isn't it? And what you say can either bring forth life or death. Now, we're not saying that when you say something, it's going to bring forth spiritual death, however, uh, physical death. However, there are some people out there that when they are told something or when something is said to them, it could tip them over the edge. Now, I don't know about you. I would rather, I would rather use my words to bring life to people. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul preached in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. He was talking about the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. And he was talking about preaching. If you preach just the law, you're going to put people under in a, 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 in a death pen or death situation where there's no spirit with the preaching of the word. There's, 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 there's no life. If there's no life, there's death. So death and life are in the power of the tongue. You know, when you think about John 8, 44, Jesus said to the Jews that they were of their father, the devil, and that he was a murderer from the beginning and when he speaketh, he doesn't speak the truth. There's no truth in him. He speaketh a lie. Again, lies. So how did he murder back in the beginning? By what he said. He deceived them. He lied to them. And they believed the lie. A death sentence was put on him. Firstly, they died spiritually straight away, but physically their bodies now began to decay. 
And so that was that's pretty powerful when you think about it. Cancerous words, cancerous words. What about lies or deviations concerning biblical truth? Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 for a moment. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. I'll read a few verses and then we'll make some comments about it. He says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker. A canker is a cancer. Their word will eat like a cancer, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Sasha, good evening. Their word doth eat like a can- canker, cancerous words. Words that will, will erode, words that will, will just devastate. He says, overthrow the faith of some. And how that there were two people and what they were saying caused those, those words caused cancerous reactions in them. As a matter of fact, it says that the word will eat at the other canker, eat away. What do you think it would eat away at? Up to me, it would eat away at their belief. It would eat away at their faith. It would eat away at their understanding. Here is Here it is. It's quite possible that when we talk about the great falling away or we talk about departing from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, it could be that many will depart from the faith because they're hearing the wrong kind of message, receiving the wrong kind of word, a word that will eat away at their faith or overthrow their faith, not lose their salvation, but just walk away, just walk away eroding, decaying their very spirituality, devastating, destructive. That's what cancer is. And we think about that in the physical, but you think about that in the spiritual, their word doth eat as a canker. Now notice what Hymenaeus and Philetus were erring from, were deviating or even lying about. Notice what it says in verse 16, who concerning the truth have erred saying that the resurrection is past already. They were lying about the resurrection. This is not dealing with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were lying about the timing of the resurrection or the rapture. That's what we're talking about. For those of us that opened door Sunday last Sunday morning, we, there's two resurrections. There's the re- resurrection of the of the saved. Then there's the resurrection of the dead. So when he's talking about the resurrection here, he's talking about the resur- that first resurrection or our gathering together under him. The timing of that. Now you know for, there were, mm, you know. I can I can understand people having a different timing of the rapture, and that's fine. I don't I don't believe that it's again a, a, an issue to say I don't want to have anything to do with you. But brethren, I, I've got to be honest with you. The, the longer I meditate on this, the more important I do feel that believing in the right timing of the rapture. These guys were lying about it. Now, there's only one truth concerning the timing of the rapture. I was out visiting today and visited with Brother John. Brother Johnny, as we call him, Johnny and Bronny. Caught up with Brother John, went out for a coffee, and we were talking about this very subject about the last days. And we were talking about the timing of the rapture and, and, and what's taking place and how that, you know, there's going to be so many who believe so strongly and sincerely that they're not going to be here for any kind of tribulation. (laughs) These folks were worried that they had missed it. They had lied about the timing of the rapture and the word that they gave about that ate away at the faith of the believer. They overthrew their faith. 
So there, in this day that this was written, there were those that were concerned that they missed it. Today, we have Christians that are so concerned about having to go through anything. Oh no, it can't be. It can't. It can't be after the midpoint. It can't be after great tribute. It can't be any of that. No, no, no. It's got to be before. It's got to be before. There's going to be so many people, brethren, that are not going to be ready for what's going to take place. So I believe the timing, the timing is important to know the timing. And I do believe, and we look at some scripture now, and I know we've gone through this, so bear with me tonight. But I do believe the timing of it is very important just for personal preparation. My responsibility to you as a preacher is to make sure I preach the truth, to make sure that through study of the word, to make sure that uh, things are lined up so that I give you, because I can only affect those of you that, that I pastor. Judy, good evening. And if I was not going to be honest with you, and if I was not going to preach my convictions, it would be like, oh, no, she'll be right, mate. We're going up before everything starts. We'll be right. We're going to get taken out of here. And then things get worse and worse and worse and worse. You know what I mean? You're like, you lied. You lied. You didn't get us prepared. We're not prepared for what's going on, Brother Jack. Good evening. So I would rather do my best now to try and prepare you for what's coming. And not err or deviate or lie to you about something that is as is important as the timing of the resurrection. So let's have a look at some scripture. We're going to come back to 2 Timothy. So just bear with me. Let's go back to 1, Timothy, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And, and let's just refresh our minds a little bit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Just back a few pages. Verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them that are asleep. We're not going to go up before the dead in Christ, all right? The dead in Christ go up first, then we which are alive and remain, as we see here, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. There's that resurrection. Oh, the resurrection's passed. You've missed it. Oh, no, what are we going to do? Now you preach, well, we're going to go up in the, after the sixth seal, before the seventh seal, which is after the midpoint. Oh, no, we're going to go through some... Persecution. <laughs> you can't win, right? The dead in Christ will rise first. Then which we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So that's a wonderful passage of scripture dealing with the, 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 our gathering together, our going up. And how that the dead go first. And it's going to be a wonderful time dealing with our gathering together unto him, right? So let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 for a moment. Again, I know you know these scriptures so well. But, you know, I was reading in 2 Timothy this morning, come across that. And I thought, you know what? Timing's pretty important. Remember I said yesterday, if you want to know the timing of God, spend time with God. That wasn't mine. Now, and I heard another preacher say that. So kudos to that guy because I truly really believe that. You want to know the timing of the rapture? You want to know about the timing of it? Spend time with God. Let God reveal to you the truths of his word. I mean, I love sharing it, you know, but hey, go search it out for yourself. Uh, second, Th oh, Where am I? Second Thessalonians. Chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, verse 1, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together under him. So the coming of the Lord and our gathering are the same thing. He's coming back to gather us. We're going to go up, all right? That you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letters from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So therefore, what we believe is that the day of Christ is connected with his coming and our gathering. That is the day of Christ. Now, we've mentioned that time and time again. The day of Christ is for the saint. The day of the Lord is for the sinner. Very easy. Okay. Let no man deceive you by any means. Let no man deceive you. The words of Hymenaeus and Philetus acted like a cancer. It ate away and destroyed and devastated the faith of the believer. Oh, you've missed it. The resurrection's past. 
Don't let any man deceive you. You are, listen, uh, uh, with all love and sincerity, I say this. You're responsible to study the word for yourself. You come to a different conclusion regarding the timing of the rapture. That's between you and God. But study the word for yourself. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day. Now, what day is that? That's the day of Christ, which is his coming to gather us up together, right? The rapture. We call that the rapture. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Timing. Timing. So we see here that there's got to be some things that are happening before the event of the day of Christ. You say, what's, what's that? First, there's a falling away and the son of perdition. The Antichrist is revealed. Okay? So this is a very, very important passage of Scripture dealing with the very important subject of the resurrection or our gathering together, his coming for us in the rapture, the day of Christ. Let any man deceive you. A lot of Hymenaeuses and Philetuses out there who are saying things and their word will eat like a canker. Let's go to, uh, let's go to I was going to go to Matthew, but let's go to uh, Mark's gospel for a moment. Mark's gospel, because a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, Matthew 24, that's for the Jews. Well, you know, most of us understand that that's not the case. But let's go to, uh, let's go to, um, Mark chapter 13, Mark chapter 13, and let's just see if, uh, you know, the, the, the timing is here in Mark 13, all right? Mark chapter 13 and verse number 19. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. You say, what in the world? You're just plucking this verse out. Right, I understand that I'm doing that. But when you look at it, we're dealing with the midpoint, the abomination of desolation. At that time, there is going to be uh, affliction such as was not from the beginning. Now, Matthew says there's going to be, and, uh, and Luke, great tribulation. Great tribulation. Trouble. Great trouble. Because tribulation is trouble. There's going to be great trouble for believers. We're going to be in trouble. <laughs> Verse 20, except that the day, uh, except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. And the, the elect and the chosen are you and I, when you look at the New Testament, all right? Now notice what he says in verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, after that affliction, after the great tribulation takes place, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give a light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in the heaven shall be shaken. And you all know, I'm sure most of you, that's the sixth seal. Okay. So we have timing now. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with great power and glory and then... Shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of the heaven? That's us going up. So the timing is very important. Wouldn't you agree with that? So therefore, when you think about Hymenaeus and Philetus and how that their word ate away at the saints like a cancer, and they were... They were lying about the timing of a very, very important event, the resurrection. Okay, So let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. What do we do about this? What do we do about this? Well, it's really here. Now, I understand that Paul is writing to his protege, Timothy, who's at Ephesus pastoring. And he says in verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Study the word of truth. Now, notice something about that verse 18, who concerning the truth, all right, who concerning the truth have erred and over, overthrew the faith. Now, here is the thing. You, you, you would expect, and rightly so, that this pastor and others should study the word. I'm sure. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the imperative here is to study, to study. And, and, and that is, that is, that's my work, to, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman. 
So every time I, I'm studying for something, I'm working. If I'm studying for devotions during the night, I'm studying for Bible class, I'm studying for preaching, whatever it is, that's my work. That's my labor. And I ought to give my all to that. But we could also say this, is uh, you expect the preacher to study? Right. But however, we should all be students of the word. You should study as well. Now, you might not get into the deep things and you might study some other things here and there, but we should all be students of the word. And so when he says here, study to show thyself approved and God a workman that need not be ashamed, because I don't want to stand to be ashamed before my congregation or the Lord. Man, he just, that, that message was all over the place. It was just disjointed. It was this, it was that. Probably there's not been much study into that. And, uh, you know, it doesn't mean I, I, I you know, me, I, I don't like a lot of notes. I've never been a, a notes person. But just because you don't have a lot of notes or no notes, it doesn't mean you haven't studied. As a matter of fact, Clarence Sexton said this, if you preach without notes, you've got to study more and harder. But notice what he says here. You, you, you study to not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, there are some very lovely and sincere brethren that will take that and say rightly dividing the word of truth is rightly dividing into dispensations that's what they say check it out right so when they look at that rightly dividing they say dispensationally but that's not the context the context is rightly dividing the word of truth to make sure that you get truth or doctrine right that you don't err or you go off into error or you go off into heresy or you start lying about what's there for your own purpose. <laughs> Taking, a, well, bless God, we need, we need a million dollars for a building program and you start preaching verses out, say out of context or what it is, whatever it is, just to get money off of people. Yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> we all know that. So rightly dividing the word of truth is not dividing into dispensation. Rightly dividing is making sure that you're rightly dividing truth, that you're comparing scripture with scripture. You're looking at context, that you're not wrongly dividing. I, 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 I have known guys to go to such an extent of um, uh, discrediting different Christians that they've wrongly divided. Wrongly divided. Even when they come to a point and they see the truth in the context, but, well, I've always believed that this means this, and so therefore I don't want to offend the preacher, brethren, so I'm just going to go along. No, no, no. What a coward. So what do you do when, when you've got the Hymenaeuses and the Philetuses that are saying things about biblical doctrine and lying about it? You study. Study the word. You know, you can't go past you and the Holy Spirit, honestly. Now, there's a lot of great helps out there. You know, obviously, there's a lot of great helps for you to look at. But don't take those helps and replace the Holy Spirit with those helps. You know, uh, a lot of preachers, again, it's up to them. They'll have their Bible, and then they've got all their commentaries fanned out. Nothing wrong. That's fine. If that's, if that's the way they are, that's the way they are, all right? However, you don't want to just, because a commentary is just basically the words of a man. You've got to be very careful that you don't fill the message with the words of men and not the words of God. Okay. So the first thing that we've got to do is we study. Secondly, we've got to shun that which is not right. Now notice what he says, but shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase under more ungodliness and conjunction their word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus who concerning the truth have erred saying, that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So when you talk about profane and vain babblings, this too is in the context of taking scripture either out of context or blatantly corrupting it. 
profane and vain babblings. <laughs> it's not hard for me. I mean, I, the, the, the toughest critic on me is me, you know what I mean? I don't want to be, be a vain babbler. <laughs> I'm glad my wife's not here. She might, oh, too late. No, anyway. Uh, so I don't want to just babble. That's why, that's why messages need to be filled with the word of God. Fill it with scripture. But shun those things that are not right. Not a Calvinist, so I want to shun that. All right, I I I I believe in 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 the the right timing of the of the of the, of tribulate of the uh, the rapture. So I want to shun those ones that are not. It doesn't mean I can't listen to the other things. If I know the preacher, an independent fundamental Baptist guy, he and I might not agree on the timing. That's fine. I won't I won't take that on board. I know what I believe about that. But that doesn't mean he's got no other good things to say. It's it's the false teachers also that you've got to watch out for. Okay, so you you don't want to take on board wrong words, wrong things, because those words will eat at you like a cancer. Cancerous words. We all agree that cancer in the physical is destructive on the body. Man, there's so many, there's brain cancers, there's lymph nodes, there's leukemia, there's, uh, you know, lung cancer, there's colon cancer, there's breast cancer, there's all sorts that we know about, bone cancer, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And it jumps around and we understand the devastation that brings upon the life of the individual, but more than that, the family the, 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 the family that's the closest, the, then there's the extended family, then there's friends. And so it sort of has far reaching effects, physically speaking. Well, I would say this, that spiritually speaking, it has far reaching effects too. That when you take on cancerous words, it's going to do you damage, but it's going to affect others too around you. Don't take on words that eat like a canker. Shun those things. Study the scriptures. Be led of the spirit. Let him guide you into all truth. Get your own convictions that nobody can take away. Amen? All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness and your blessing. We do pray, dear God, that you would help us to be good workmen, studying your word, rightly dividing, uh, not taking the truth and deviating from it, and erring, lying, but may we be holy and sincere in our approach to your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, God bless you. Thank you for joining tonight. I appreciate that. Have a good evening. Have a good day tomorrow and look forward to seeing you tomorrow night at 7.30. Until then, God bless. Goodbye for now.